This social skills instruction training is being presented by the Delaware Network for Excellence in Autism. Welcome, my name is Alicia Fletcher and I am a trainer with the Delaware Network for Excellence in Autism, or the DNEA. Today, we will be discussing social skills strategies for students with autism. The Delaware Network for Excellence in Autism offers training, technical assistance, and information dissemination to community organizations, agencies, and those directly impacted by autism needs across the lifespan. The DNEA leverages interdisciplinary expertise across multiple organizations, state agencies, and specialists. The DNEA is led by the Center for Disability Studies and network member Autism Delaware. The Interagency Committee on Autism, or ICA, is made up of various disciplines and agencies, family members of individuals with autism, and a person with autism oversees the work being done within the DNEA. Today we will review the core characteristics of autism, discuss social skills development and how that development can look different for students with autism, consider ways of assessing social skills and skills to target, explore evidence-based strategies that can support autistic students, and review additional resources. This content was developed as part of a collaboration between the Delaware Department of Education, Delaware Office of Statewide Autism Programs, and Delaware Network for Excellence in Autism at the University of Delaware Center for Disability Studies. Please use the following citation when referencing this training content. At the completion of this training, participants will have increased knowledge about social skills development and how it differs for students with autism, misconceptions about individuals with autism and social skills, importance of assessment and prioritizing skills to target, evidence-based practices for supporting social interactions, and additional state and national resources and support. Before we dive into today's topic, I would like to review how I will be discussing disability. It used to be that we defaulted to person-first language, which puts a person before a diagnosis describing what condition a person has rather than asserting what a person is. For example, a person with a disability or saying a person without a disability. However, many in the disability community have shifted to using identity first language. For example, saying an autistic student or a disabled person. This language emphasizes that the disability is part of who the person is and is seen as important and positive aspect of their identity. In this talk, you will notice that I'm going to use both person and identity first language. It is important to communicate respect for people when using either person or identity first language. This is a list of some phrases to avoid when talking about a person with a disability. Instead of saying my people, my kids, my caseload, refer to your students by name or by the group with whom you are working with, such as students in my classroom or George, who is in Miss Hall's classroom. Instead of re referencing a student's parent by mom, you should call them by their name or reference them in a re relation to your student. For example, Billy's parents. Finally, acceptable alternatives to the disabled or stricken with includes the use of neutral language, like they have a disability. Let's begin by reviewing the core characteristics of autism. According to the CDC, the current autism prevalence rate is one in every 44 children. Autism is four times more common in boys than in girls. We don't know what is causing the increase in prevalence, but it could be due to changes in how children are identified, diagnosed, and served in their communities, as well as the continued reductions in racial or socioeconomic disparities. Before we discuss common characteristics of autism, it may be helpful to review the different ways autism is described. You can see um, three different descriptions on this slide by the CDC, the DSM, and IDEA. As a public health entity, the CDC reports rates of autism, like those that we discussed in the previous slide. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is the handbook used by healthcare professionals to guide the diagnosis of mental disorders. 
The DSM contains descriptions, symptoms, and other criteria used for diagnosis. We say that a child has a diagnosis of autism when we know that the DSM criteria were used to diagnose that child. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, is a law that makes available a free and appropriate public education to eligible children. In order to qualify for special education services, a child's disability must adversely affect their performance in school. Other characteristics often associated with autism are engagement in repetition activities and stereotype movements, resistance to environmental changes or changes in daily routines, and unusual responses to sensory experiences. Unlike the other two definitions, you will note that there is an added clause of that adversely affects a child's educational performance. Meeting these criteria means that a child has an educational classification of autism. Understanding the differences and similarities between a medical diagnosis of autism and an educational classification is important. Each process involves an evaluation of a child's strengths and areas of need, and each may lead to different supports and services. Educational evaluations and medical evaluations are not the same. The purpose of an educational evaluation is to determine the eligibility for special education services. The purpose of a medical evaluation is to make a diagnosis. A medical diagnosis is not required prior to conducting an evaluation for special education services. However, if a student already has a medical diagnosis, the school must review any outside evaluations. Educational and medical results can be different. Based on the different criteria that are used, it is possible that a child who has a medical diagnosis with autism may not be eligible for special education services under a classification of autism. Similarly, a student who receives special education services under a classification of autism may not receive a medical diagnosis. For the purposes of this training, we are going to discuss the core characteristics of autism in general terms. As a review, there are two areas of development that differ in individuals with autism. Autism is characterized by differences with social communication and a demonstration of restricted repetitive patterns of behaviors or interests. These differences impact how a student functions at school. Differences in social communication and social interactions can manifest in a variety of ways and to a variety of varying degrees, including limited or absent speech, trouble comprehending others' emotions or nonverbal communication, or difficulty maintaining a back and forth dialogue. Restricted interest and repetitive behaviors arise in a variety of ways. Children with autism may play with toys in a manner that is different than their intended use. This may include sorting them by size or color, lining things up, or focusing on unique characteristics. Additionally, they have, may have uncommon interests in items that are not typically of interest to children, such as dishwashers, pencils, or state flags. Individuals with autism may adhere to rigid behavioral routines, such as a strict bedtime ritual in which everything must be done in the same order. For example, they may brush their teeth first with a blue toothbrush and then put on their pajama pants followed by a gray sleep shirt and then read Goodnight Moon. Children with autism exhibit these characteristics in a variety of ways and to varying degrees. Throughout this training, we will be discussing how these core areas relate to social skills and functioning at school, and we will highlight strategies designed to specifically support students in these core areas. Let's start by reviewing the differences in social communication and social interactions. Some social interaction needs are related to peer relationships with difficulty initiating and maintaining conversation or taking turns in conversations. Many autistic people struggle with joint attention or the ability to share focus on an object or area with another person. Following someone else's gaze or pointing a finger to look at something are examples of joint attention. We see difficulties with emotional reciprocity as well as initiating, maintaining, or responding to communication attempts. We also see difficulty with staying on topic and understanding other points of view. Understanding nonverbal gestures such as hand signals, nods, and facial expressions can also be difficult. 
During social interactions, people with autism may make too much or too little eye contact. It is common misconception that people with autism do not want friends. This is untrue. People with autism desire friendships, but do not always understand or demonstrate the same social skills as their peers in order to make and maintain friendships. Some areas of need and communication skills can be language development slowing or not progressing. A child with autism often will not reach developmental milestones related to communication. Echolalia is the repeated repetitive um, repeated of words or phrases, such as repeating a question instead of answering it, or excessively reciting from movies, cartoons, or commercials. Expressive communication, or the time it takes to put thoughts into words, may also be affected. Individuals can use varied communication methods. They may communicate using augmented or alternative communication devices, or AAC, the Picture Exchange Communication System, or PEX as well as gestures, switches, or other methods. Individuals with autism may also have difficulty understanding sarcasm or metaphors. It can be difficult to distinguish between a speaker's intended meaning and what they actually say. Telling someone to take a seat, for example, could be interpreted as picking up the chair. The next core area we are going to talk about is restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interest, or activities. This slide provides some examples of restricted repetitive patterns of behaviors. Individuals with autism may engage in repetitive movements or self-simulatory activities that soothe or stimulate, such as rocking, twirling, or hand flapping. You may also encounter resistance to change, what can, can manifest as difficulty transitioning from one activity to another, especially if the transition is unexpected. Some people may have specific or narrow interests, for example, specific bands, calendar dates, toys, or TV shows. Autistic people may also struggle to generalize or apply information learned in one setting to another. Often there can be an increased or decreased sensitivity to sensation, like touch, sound, or taste. It may manifest as narrow eating habits, refusal to wear certain types of clothing or fabrics, or covering their ears when exposed to loud noises. As mentioned, many people with autism find it difficult to process everyday sensory information. They can be hypersensitive, oversensitive, or hyposensitive, which is undersensitive, to sensory input. Sensory differences can affect how a person feels and acts and can have a significant impact on a person's life. The way a person responds to sensory experiences can change from day to day. Sensory differences at school could include bright lights or loud noises, such as children yelling at recess. A child may have difficulty paying attention because their clothing is uncomfortable. Undersensitive children may find, be fidgety and unable to sit still. They may seek stimulation by bumping, jumping, or crashing into other children. Now let's move on to social skills development. Social development is a complex and ever-changing process. Because social skills are interconnected with all other developmental domains, like cognitive and language, they become increasingly complex as children grow. Social development begins in infancy and occurs in the context of interactions with primary caregivers followed by interactions with other people. Because social development occurs due to these naturally occurring interactions, most children appear to naturally develop social skills. Infants, for example, show an early preference for human faces and voices, which sets the stage for early interactions and later development of advanced social skills. Playing simple games like peekaboo, for example, leads to turn-taking and later problem-solving in social situations. A student's social-emotional development includes their awareness, expression, and management of emotions, as well as their capacity to form healthy and rewarding relationships with others. Social competency does not develop independently of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral development. A student's social skills play a role in making friends, learning from others, and developing hobbies and interests. These skills can also help a child develop a sense of belonging. Emotional development includes the ability to identify and understand one's feelings, accurately read and comprehend others' emotional states, manage strong emotions and their expressions constructively, regulate one's behavior, develop empathy for others, and establish and maintain friendships. 
The first five years of life are a time of remarkable growth for children in every aspect of their development. Social and emotional development encompasses a child's awareness, expression, and management of emotions and their capacity to form healthy and rewarding relationships with others. At the elementary level, social skills begin with the fundamentals of learning of how to interact in a structured setting with other children and people who are not members of their families. At these ages, basic social skills often include manners, taking turns, making friends, and controlling one's emotions, all of which assist students to adjust to the structure of the school environment and will become significant parts of their lives. In adolescence, a child's social development begins to reach new levels. This is a point when most children will spend more hours in a day with their peers than with their parents. Throughout adolescence, establishing and maintaining close friendship with peers and learning and adapting to school and society rules are crucial developmental tasks. Now let's discuss differences in social development among students with autism. One of the core characteristics of autism is difficulty with social communication. This means that children with autism often struggle with social interactions. To help students be more successful at school, it can be helpful to understand some of the differences we see among children with autism. These differences are often the result of the way autistic children process information. Babies who develop autism begin making less eye contact around two months of age, and they may point and gesture significantly less. Many babies with autism do not orient to their names. In early childhood, caregivers and teachers may notice a reduced preference for human faces or faces or participation in social games like peekaboo. Children may spend less time attending to non-social things like appliances. As children further grow in development, early differences may persist with a new arising difficulty with perspective taking or reduced pretend cooperative back and forth play with others. This may show limited initiation of joint attention and impaired language using comprehension. As children with autism progress through school, their limited use of language may inhibit ability to mediate behaviors and challenges may arise related to engaging in reciprocal conversation and interactions. Students may show difficulties interpreting social cues such as facial expressions, gestures, body language, or tone of voice. They may have difficulties with perspective taking or knowing how others feel based on their behavior. There may also be difficulties distinguishing relevant from irrelevant details during problem solving situations and difficulties regulating behaviors and emotions. Now let's look at some of the social challenges that autistic students may face at school. Many of the social aspects of the school that are interesting and fun for some students can be stressful or overwhelming for a student with autism. The social rules at school and the social skills needed to navigate these social social rules are typically unspoken and not explicitly taught to children. Let's consider a simple act like entering a classroom. It may be difficult for a student with autism to understand the unspoken social rules related to classroom seating arrangements. They may be unsure of where to sit, nervous about who to sit next to and who not to sit next to, or forget about the assigned seat that they already might have. Additionally, it is tricky to understand the concept of small talk and how people par- how to participate and how small talk differs between people, friends, adults, and peers. Further examples of challenges experienced throughout the day relate to knowing where to keep one bodies when concerning others, maintaining appropriate distance when going down the hallway, and how to choose um, how close or far to sit away from someone. Understanding conversation skills can also be sometimes complex, such as determining who to talk with, what to say, or how to say it. Sensory differences can be difficult in a school setting. For example, the sound volume, the number of people in an area, or the materials used in classes. Moreover, it can be challenging to understand procedural changes throughout the school day, such as the order and steps of routines. Schools should strive to provide an environment that is sensitive to the needs of autistic children. There is a viral Facebook post by a teacher named Karen Blancher in October of 2020. She says, when we treat autistic children the way the world tells us to treat neurotypical children, they suffer. But I have never encountered a child of any age or neurotype who doesn't thrive when treated like an autistic person should be treated with open communication, adaptive expectations, and respect for self-advocacy and self-regulation, 
Maybe neurodiverse people aren't the only ones who've been misunderstood and mistreated all this time. They're just the ones who feel it the most. Let's move on and talk about some behavioral differences that might be obvious and some that might be harder to spot. Teachers work hard to make the school day fun and interesting for students. Many of the social aspects of school, like singing during carpet time or morning meetings, making friends, working with peers, and participating in special events may be difficult for students with autism. That is because these activities often do not align with the strategies and strengths of an autistic student, but rather these skills areas may be difficult. Students with autism who have sensory differences, communication needs, social differences, or restricted repetitive patterns of behavior often find social activities stressful and sometimes maybe even unenjoyable. It's easy to spot when social differences pose a problem for an autistic child, um, when someone's dominating a conversation, struggles to take turns while playing a game, has a hard time understanding role changes in a game like tag, or laughs when a peer shares that her dog has died. However, it can be more challenging to make the connection between social skills and behaviors when a student requests to eat lunch in the library, doesn't respond when a peer greets them, doesn't join the robotics club even though they plan to major in the field of engineering, or plays alone at recess. Given that social development in individuals with autism differs quite significantly from typical social development, individuals with autism exhibit differences in social behaviors. As we mentioned earlier, our social rules and expectations are socially constructed based on how the majority of children develop. Therefore, we often interpret things from that perspective. Looking at an individual with autism and their behaviors or interactions through the lens of typical development may lead to incorrect assumptions about a person with autism. Social development is different in individuals with autism from an early age and leads to differences in overt behaviors. However, it is important to not make assumptions about an individual's underlying thoughts, emotions, or desires based on differences in certain preferences or behaviors. It is also important to remember that just like people without autism, people with autism have different degrees of social interests and other attributes that may vary from one person to another. Just because students' interests may differ doesn't mean that they don't have significant interest in other people. They may not know how to begin to interact with a peer and they may express themselves in different ways. Challenges understanding social roles and differences in social skills are often misread as a desire to avoid people or social situations, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Most individuals with autism badly want to interact with others. They simply don't have the skill set to do so easily. The idea that students with autism lack empathy is also a myth. They feel as much and possibly more empathy as others. Because of the differences in development, individuals with autism have difficulty taking others' perspectives and responding in the same way others do, but this does not mean they lack empathy or do not care about other people. They may express feelings of empathy in different ways. Additionally, anxiety in social interactions may be misinterpreted as cold or uncaring. Individuals with autism may struggle with different aspects of their social behavior. However, along with these challenges, they bring gifts and unique individuality that they could only bring because of their autism. We need to shift away from focusing on their deficits to focusing on their strengths. Social skills required for interacting with others and developing and maintaining connections can be problematic for students with autism, affecting their academic performance, mental health, and overall behavior. For students with autism, a lack of social skills can have long-term consequences, compromising their families, communities, interactions, academic skills, self-worth, and independence. As autistic children grow and develop, sometimes there are gaps in understanding and responding to others' thoughts and feelings the same way as people without autism. These challenges frequently arise because of individuals' difficulties understanding social thinking of a people without autism. Without understanding why, an autistic person may unknowingly hurt another person's feelings or ask inappropriate questions. This could make a person with autism more susceptible to teasing, bullying, or isolation. Students who have difficulty with social skills have been shown to experience differences in interpersonal relationships with parents, teachers, and peers. 
Peer rejection has been linked on several occasions with school violence. Students with autism with poor social skills can show signs of depression, aggression, and anxiety. Research also shows a higher incidence of involvement in the criminal justice system as adults. Let's meet Chris. Chris is an autistic sophomore in high school. He gets good grades but hasn't developed any close peer relationships. He sits by himself at lunch frequently wearing his AirPods. Chris engages in self-stimulatory behaviors of repeatedly clearing his throat, which makes an audible sound. During his parent-teacher conference, his teacher, Ms. Fink, shared that Chris lacks social interest and seems uninterested in forming meaningful relationships. In reality, Chris finds school socially overwhelming and doesn't know how to navigate his way towards better social engagement. The result of the misperception leaves him without the social support that he needs to develop meaningful social connections. Let's move on to assessing and targeting social skills. The first step in setting students up for success is to gather information about a student to help create appropriate goals. Research tells us that there are direct relationships between self-determination and quality of life. When a student sets goals and makes decisions on their behalf, they are more independent and show better integration in their communities. It is important that an autistic person plays a significant role in establishing their social goals. People socialize in a variety of ways. When autistic students are taught that there is a right and a wrong way to use social skills during social interactions, they may also experience significant amounts of emotional distress because they feel they are pretending to be someone that they are not when engaging with others. This is often referred to as masking or camouflaging. It is the suppression of autistic traits to act more normal. Masking requires a significant amount of effort. Many autistic people contend that if they spend the entire day masking at school, they need to come home and sit alone for a while to recover. Some autistic people also feel as if they are impersonating themselves and they want to stop masking so that their friends can get to know the real them. Research suggests that camouflaging autistic traits is associated with increased risk of lifetime suicidality. Let's talk about some strategies for assessing social skills and revisit Chris. After the parent-teacher conference, Miss Fink realizes that she misread Chris and the idea that he's not interested in having friends. She reaches out to Chris to let him know that she would like to get to know him better and invites him to have lunch in her classroom. He accepts the invitation and they have lunch together over the next few days. As Miss Fink forms a relationship with Chris, she learns about many of his strengths and his goal to become a mechanical engineer in college. This gets Miss Fink thinking. And she asked Chris if she has if he's ever considered joining the robotics club at school. Chris shared that he thought about it but wasn't sure how to join and what it would be like and if he could even be a member. She talks with Chris about it more and about his interests in the robotics club and she obtains his consent for further investigation of this opportunity. Before working on social skills, an assessment may be completed to help identify specific areas of need. Assessments should gather information about a student's strengths and areas of need, focusing on specific behaviors or lack of behaviors interfering with social functioning. It's important to get input from various sources to help select behaviors to teach, reduce, replace, and prioritize. Multiple tools can gather information about a student's social skills in a school setting. School psychologists, speech-language pathologists, they typically have access to standardized measures. Ideally, using multiple methods of assessment together is best. Tools differ in the information collected and of ease of use. Consider this when planning the roles of the team members. We need to understand the behaviors of autistic children to help them. As mentioned earlier, a critical way of gaining this type of clarity is to involve the autistic student in the evaluation process. Along with a student, different members of a student's IEP team have different perspectives that can help provide further information needed to develop goals and inform treatment. School personnel, therapists, parents, and others involved in their lives should be involved. One helpful process that may be used when beginning a new social activity is called an ecological inventory. Ecological inventories can be used to identify expectations that a student may encounter in a current or future environment. Ecological inventories can help identify the targeted behaviors and the skills that will be needed to be successful in a given environment. 
They can also be used to collect information about the unique social demands and situations a student with autism may encounter when starting and entering into a new environment. There are three important implementation steps that need to be followed when completing an ecological inventory. First, identify the environment that the student wants to access. Next, specify the sub-environments associated with the environment. Finally, you will need to determine the activities required to participate in each sub-environment. Let's look at a sample ecological inventory related to Chris's consideration of joining the robotics club. Based on what Ms. Fink knows about Chris, he is interested in attending the robotics club. To help feel Chris feel supported in the process of joining and participating in the robotics club, Ms. Fink met with Chris and, with his permission, offered to help him gain the skills needed to attend meetings. Ms. Fink's approach of directly involving Chris in the discussion fosters trust and empowers Chris to participate in the decision-making process. He states that he intends to major in engineering in college and would like to join the school's robotic club. In response, Ms. Fink attends a robotics club meeting to gain better idea of how it is run. She completes an ecological inventory to understanding the unique demands and opportunities Chris will encounter while participating in the robotics club. Ms. Fink identifies four sub-environments associated with the robotics club. Tracking club activities remotely, attending club meetings, participating in breakout group work, and leaving the meeting with the expectation that he will complete outside work. Individual activities and sub-skills associated with each sub-environment were listed. You can see examples of them listed in the right column. Ms. Fink also uses this list of activities to identify ones that may prove challenging for Chris. Ms. Fink considers what she observed during the meeting. She conducted an ecological inventory to help identify what components of the robotic club may prove difficult for Chris. During the meetings, group members sat on the floor, and because of his sensory differences, this has been identified as a potential challenge for Chris. Plans will need to be made to modify where or how he sits. At the start of the meeting, each member provides a short introduction stating their name and grade. Ms. Fink knows that Chris doesn't always know what to say or understand when it's his turn to speak. Ms. Fink also noticed that students worked in small groups as part of the meeting structure. In the classroom, Ms. Fink has observed that Chris does not keep up during group conversations that move quickly. The analysis is a valuable tool to highlight a student's strengths and needs directly related to the target environment. It provides structure and direction when identifying and prioritizing social skills to target to help students gain confidence to participate in social interactions that they are eager to join. Before moving on, it's important to revisit the concept of masking. Remember that many autistic people experience significant emotional distress because they feel they are pretending to be someone that they are not when engaging with others. It may be tempting to think you are trying to fix a person with autism and make them normal. However, disability is a dimension of diversity, and it is important that we are not asking a person with autism to change who they are for the benefit of people who do not have autism. When supporting a person with autism and reaching their social goals, we should also consider how factors like school climates are better addressed so that we can ensure that we are promoting an inclusive and accepting school setting. Here is a quote from a female autistic young adult self-advocate who shares her feelings about having to camouflage. Sometimes, when I have had to do a lot of camouflaging in a high-stress environment, I feel as though I've lost track of who I really am and that my actual self is floating above me somewhere like a balloon. Before we move on to evidence-based strategies, let's take a few minutes to discuss some mental health considerations to be aware of when working on any type of social skills. When working with students with autism, social concerns and mental behavioral health concerns often co-occur and are interrelated. Co-occurring concerns must be considered when planning social skills interventions. It may be necessary to simultaneously address co-occurring concerns or address them before certain types of social skills interventions. For example, if a student is withdrawing from social situations, we may attribute that as an artifact of their autism. However, there may be anxiety associated with that over and above autism. So, when you think about treatment, you may want to target social skills instructions and miss the social anxiety. 
However, suppose there's a recognition that there is anxiety. In that case, there's a recognition that a condition of social skills development requires behavioral therapy to address the anxiety and to feel more comfortable socializing. Other possible options or modifications include individual or small group social skills instructions, referral for individual counseling, or considering a behavior intervention plan. If a student engages in challenging behaviors that interfere with social functioning, it may be necessary to conduct a functional behavior assessment and develop a behavior support plan before starting social skills instruction. For example, a student who engages in significant challenging behaviors could still benefit from one-on-one adult-led strategies, but may need to stabilize before participating in social skills groups or working with a peer model. Let's move on to talk about what makes a practice evidence-based. Now we are going to move on to some more specific practices that can be used to support development of social skills among autistic students. You may hear a lot about evidence-based practices, but not everybody knows what makes a practice evidence-based. A practice is identified as evidence-based if it has multiple studies to support its use. These studies must be of high quality, that is, they use valid and sound research methods, and they must be published in peer-reviewed journals, that is, other experts in the field have examined the studies and deemed them to be of a high quality. It can be pretty difficult to determine if a practice is evidence-based, so a number of clearinghouse exists in the field of autism and education that are tasked with looking at all of the research published on a particular practice in order to determine if it meets the threshold for being evidence-based. Some of these clearinghouses noted here also have been excellent resources for educators to learn more about these practices. Here in the state of Delaware, the DNEA was established to disseminate high-quality information about evidence-based practices and supports with people with autism across the lifespan. We are going to discuss a number of evidence-based social skill strategies that can benefit all students, but especially those with autism. These strategies can be and should be used in all environments, from inclusive general education classrooms to self-contained environments. Let's begin by reviewing prompting, reinforcement, visual supports, and task analysis. Prompting is an evidence-based strategy that involves providing any type of assistance to a student to help them perform a specific skill or behavior. Prompting can help all students learn, and we use prompting because it can be applied across different domains and contexts, clarify expectations, increases predictability, increases the rate of skill acquisition, and decreases frustration. Reinforcement is an evidence-based practice that clarifies expectation and provides feedback for a wide range of behaviors. In a classroom, we should aim to have five praise statements for every one corrective statement. That's a lot. Visual supports are concrete cues that are paired with or used in place of a verbal cue to provide the learner with information about a routine, activity, behavioral expectation, or skill demonstration. Visual supports might include pictures or written words, objects, arrangements of environments, visual boundaries, schedules, maps, labels, systems, timelines, and scripts. They are really powerful because they help understand the physical environment, understand expectations, and create consistency across environments. Task analysis is an evidence-based strategy used to break down and teach complex or chain behaviors to increase independence in completing complex tasks. When thinking about social skills, this could be the steps students follow when greeting a peer, taking turns in a game, or sitting with peers at lunch. Here's a picture of a task analysis for taking turns during game play. You can see how each step is outlined for the student. The visual stage of this student would be text through pictures that were added to make the support more interesting and visually appealing. Now that we have reviewed the fundamentals, let's dive into some practices starting with social narratives. Social narratives are aimed at helping learners adjust to changes in routine and adapt their behaviors based on the social and physical cues of a situation or to teach specific skills, social skills or behaviors. Social narratives are individualized according to the learner's needs and are typically short, often including pictures or other visual aids. 
Social narratives are learning tools designed to teach individuals how to do something new with the goal of addressing a topic that is challenging or confusing. The story or explanation is written from the perspective of the student, so that would be the first person, and they often incorporate pictures and words that are developmentally appropriate for that student. This is example focuses on Chris's identified goal of introducing himself at the robotics club meeting. Chris is motivated to learn this skill and uses the social narrative as a tool that will help boost his social confidence. The first step in writing a social narrative is to start with a descriptive statement. This truthful, opinion-free sentence is often the backbone of the social narrative, bringing logic and accuracy to the story. As you can see, this sentence identified Chris's goal of learning how to introduce himself to the group during a meeting. The directive sentence identifies um, a suggested response or choice of response to a situation con or concept, generally directing the student. Directive sentences may also be stated as a series of response options. In Chris's case, the directive sentence provides him with the response when it is his turn to introduce himself. The perspective statement describes or refers to a person's internal state, knowledge, thoughts, feelings, beliefs, opinions, or motivations. They are used to refer to the internal um, status of other people. They are used to refer to the infer internal status of other people. For example, knowing each other's names makes us feel like we are all belonging in the same group. Lastly, the affirmative sentence enhances the meaning of surrounding statements, often expressing a commonly shared value or opinion within a given culture. Specifically, the sentence is meant to stress an important point or reassure the student. Our example highlights the important point of why it's important to introduce yourself. Here is Chris's social narrative about introducing himself during the robotics club. Chris reads at grade level, so no extra pictures were needed or added. When I go to robotics club meetings, I will need to introduce myself to the group. At the start of the meeting, I will sit in the member circle while we take turns introducing ourselves. I know it's my turn when the person next to me is finished talking. After they finished, it's now my turn. I will look at the other group members and say, Hello everyone, my name is Chris and I'm a sophomore. Telling everyone in the group a bit about me is important. Knowing each other's names makes me feel like we all belong in the group. It's very important to introduce myself to the group. Here are some other examples of social narratives with pictures and more examples of personalized stories laid out yet another way, also including pictures. Now that you've selected a social narrative that explains the situation, event, or skill you want to teach, it's important to develop a routine of when you will read the social narrative with a student. It's important to use social narratives as a preparation tool. Try to do it the same time every day. If possible, it's helpful to review it before the target skill is used or the event occurs. Using reinforcement and praise for the student for reading it or listening to the social narrative every time you review it. When the event, situation, or skill occurs, it is helpful to prompt and praise the student by using the language that is used in the social narrative. If the student needs help doing the skill explained in the social narrative, you can model how to do each skill or practice doing the skill with them. Adjust the where, when, and how often the social narrative is read based on the student's needs. Now that we have reviewed social narratives, let's discuss how to use modeling with other evidence-based practices to teach social skills. Like all our strategies, it is important that we accompany modeling with careful planning. Before using modeling, you must ensure your student has the necessary prerequisite skills. They should be able to imitate others, sustain their attention long enough to view a model, and have mastered some components of the target skill. Once you know your student has these prerequisite skills, you can begin planning and using the practice of modeling. The steps for modeling are to operationally define the target skill or behavior, then determine if the model will be used as a prime or a prompt. Next, determine if the model will be provided in person or a video. Following, identifying, identify and train the model, gain parental consent if using video. Next, determine when skills can be practiced in video viewed if applicable. 
Next is to select prompting procedures and reinforcements that will be used. Next will be to identify permanent supports that may be needed. And finally, select a data collection procedure. As you can see, modeling can be done live or using a pre-recorded video. Additionally, whenever possible, you should use age-appropriate peer models instead of an adult. I want to take a moment to review the two types of modeling procedures, modeling as a prime and modeling as a prompt. When modeling as a prime, we model for the student every time we want them to display the behavior. This is typically done by delivering the teacher cue that will be used to elicit the target behavior, cueing for the student to observe the model, and demonstrating the behavior for the student to copy. If the student does not respond to the model, a controlling prompt can be used to assist the student. When modeling as a prime, you are priming the student with a model so that they can successfully demonstrate the behavior on their own. Modeling as a prompt is a little different. When modeling as a prompt, you deliver your instructional cue and wait for your student to respond independently. If they do not respond on their own, you can then model the behavior and use a controlling prompt if needed to help your student display the behavior. This is an effective prompt to use when modeling is needed on an as-needed basis. Let's think about Chris. If Ms. Fink were to use modeling as a prime, she might select a peer model to work with Chris during the small group work during a robotics club. If he was unsure of when or how to respond during the collaborative process, he could model his behavior and respond based on the peer model. Chris would know to look at his peer to help make sure he was responding in the correct format until he understood the structure of the breakout groups. Video modeling is a practice that is, uses technology to provide a visual model of a targeted behavior or skill. It can be used as a prime or as a prompt. Like modeling, video modeling can be used as a standalone instructional practice or combined with other evidence-based practices such as self-management, social skills teaching, or social narratives. Video modeling is different from live modeling because you can offer the students three points of views. You can record a peer model engaging in the behavior, record your student engaging in the behavior, or use point of view modeling where the student is not watching a person engaging in the behavior, but is rather seeing the behavior from the points of view of the person. Here you can see three different points of view modelings and the skills that are best used to address these models. There's a lot of exciting and emerging research to support the use of video modeling for teaching social skills to students with autism. Video modeling allows us to use students' existing technology, such as iPads or cell phones, to access the video models. A few important things to remember if you decide to use a video model to teach social skills. You may need to prompt the student to attend to specific features of the video. For instance, if you're working on greetings, be sure to point out the greeting on the video. Watch the way that she turns her body to say hello to him when he sat down next to her. You may also need to prompt and reinforce your student to attend to the video when introducing a video model. Finally, when using a video modeling as a prompt to teach chain behaviors, make sure to add a pause in the video between steps of the chain to allow students to demonstrate that step. It is important to ensure that the student can follow along and not get lost. Here is a video that models turn taking during gameplay. If this were a target social skills for one of your students, it is important to remember to show them the video before they engage in the gameplay and verbally prompt the skills during the game. Since this involves other peers, it is important to show peers the video to help ensure appropriate modeling during play. All right, can I be this person? Sure. Sure, Greg, you can be this person. Lauren, you go first. Okay. I got a three. One, two, three. Greg, it's your turn. Five. Five. Your turn. Two. One. Two. Now it's your turn. My turn again. Four. One, two, three, four. My turn. Remember to provide reinforcement when the student engages in the target behavior and provide multiple opportunities to practice the target social skills. 
Let's move on to our next practice, social skills and structured playgroups. Social skills instruction refers to adult-directed teaching in which social skills are targeted for improvement. Social skills instructions typically occur in group or individual format and may also include facilitated practice in classroom settings. Studies report that social skills instructions can effectively address social, communication, behavior, play, and cognitive outcomes across all ages. Teachers and other professionals can implement social skills instructions. Parents and family members can also be invaluable in supporting the learning, generalization, and maintenance of social skills by helping their child practice skills in the home and reinforcing the social skills they see their child using with family members and peers. Let's check in with Chris. Ms. Long, a speech therapist at Chris's school, is starting a social skills group that meets during lunch and offers Chris the opportunity to participate. At first, he was a bit reluctant, but then he agreed. Before starting the group, Ms. Long connects with Chris's teacher, Ms. Fink, about the data collected during the ecological inventory. Since this group is a great opportunity for Chris to learn and practice some of the skills he will need to participate in the robotics club, Ms. Long uses his identified goals to inform her planning. To make the group more meaningful for Chris, Ms. Long makes direct connections between skills being taught and practiced during the group and relates them to the structure of the robotics club. For example, during group, Ms. Long may say, let's begin the group by introducing ourselves to the group by stating our name and grade. She quietly tells Chris, this is how the robotic clubs begins their meeting, so this is really good practice for you. Ms. Long is doing a great job of making the group meaningful for Chris. It's also important that the team members be aware of Chris's participation. For example, Ms. Long shares information about weekly target skills with Ms. Fink and each of his teachers and asks them to discreetly prompt, collect data on, and reinforce his engagement in the social skills being targeted. Information about weekly goals is also shared with his parents and strategies to set up opportunities to work on the skills at home. Let's review the detailed steps for planning a social skills group. It is important to prepare for social skills instructions. There are many ways that social skills can be taught. To be sure that you are planning with your students' goals in mind, it's important to think about the following. Decide on the format of the instruction. Determine whether the training will be delivered in an individual or group format based on a variety of factors, such as the learner's skills and developmental level, the trainer's availability, space availability, and scheduling limitations. Select peers for participation. Consider the grade level and needs of the other possible participants when choosing peers. Determine if peer models will be used. To learn more about a learner's current social skills as well as areas of need, use informal and formal evaluation and assessment approaches. Choose the topic of the lessons. Consider the needs of the autistic learner and group members. Remember that large groups topics of instruction may have underlying components to the skill that must also be addressed. Next, decide on a meeting structure. Each session of social skills teaching should follow a consistent format. The lesson should focus at a minimum, contain a check-in, introduction and teaching of a new skill, practice of the new skill, feedback, and a chance to practice the skill outside of the lesson. A variety of instructional strategies can be used to teach social skills including modeling, video modeling, role play, prompting, reinforcement, and the use of visual supports. Before you begin social skills training, you will need to prepare the materials. If you have selected a specific curriculum to support your instruction, such as peers, you will need to obtain those materials. Make sure that everyone who is leading the group is prepared and familiar with the lesson plan and the reinforcement system for plan for participants. Finally, determine the meeting schedule. A meeting time and place for the training needs to be selected that is convenient for both the learner with autism, other members, and leaders. As with all evidence-based practices we have discussed thus far, it is important to implement in a planned manner and monitor use. When implementing social skills instruction, it is essential to remember to implement instruction as planned. Reinforce the learner when they use the target skills. Collaborate with parents and other professionals to support the generalization of skills and provide and show gratitude to any peer models. 
Monitoring can be done by collecting data on the learner, using the target skill, and using the data to determine the next step based on progress. Now, let's talk about how Ms. Long supports the generalization of Chris's social skills outside of the group. To help Chris generalize the new social skills, his educational team must work together to understand his goals, method to accomplish these goals, and each member's role in the process. Chris might learn new skills in a social skills group, but never show these skills in any other environment or with other people outside of the group. Many of the interventions discussed include components that lead themselves to generalization. However, direct ways to systematically target generalization still must be planned. Planning for generalization is especially important because social skills are often highly context development. Thus, more teaching may have to go into when to use specific skills and how certain skills may need to differ depending on various factors. Consider setting up a structured activities for a student to practice a skill in different settings, with different people, during different activities. It may be helpful to incorporate a peer model to help reinforce the use of target skills in generalization contexts. We will talk more about peer-mediated interventions in a few minutes. Let's first talk about structured playgroups. Structured playgroups are characterized by a small, predetermined group of children, including children with and without identified disabilities, who meet consistently to engage in structured routines and define play activities within a defined space. They are facilitated by adults who use evidence-based practices, such as prompting and reinforcement, through clear roles to support the target child's needs of skills and behaviors during playtime. The approach has been proven effective for young children up to 11 years old. Select play themes, activities, and materials for the playgroup that are tailored to the children's ages, interests, development, and the skills being addressed. One to two facilitators are needed to observe and work with the group's dynamics and address the individual's learning needs of the child with autism. The ratio of learners with autism to peers without autism should range from one student with autism to two to three peers. When identifying what skills or behaviors to focus on, consider choosing skills that afford multiple opportunities to practice in a group setting, ones that require social interaction or communication, and ones that lend themselves to activities most likely to be done in play groups. The groups afford the opportunity to incorporate a variety of instructional strategies such as modeling, prompting, reinforcement, role play, and visual supports. Depending on the age and development of the children, a group should last between 30 and 60 minutes. Structured play groups typically meet two times per week for a minimum of three months and up to one year. Let's take a little break from Chris and meet Adam. Adam is a seven-year-old second grader with autism who has different needs than Chris. Adam is nonverbal and uses his iPad as an augmentative and alternative communication tool, often abbreviated as AAC. Adams communicates through the Proloquo 2 app on his iPad, which allows him to express himself using symbol-based AAC. Adams' teachers, parents, and IEP team identified making friends as a goal for Adam. To help meet the, his goal, he will participate in a structured playgroup with three peers and one adult group leader to target improvement of social, communication, and play skills. The group leader chooses play themes, activities, and materials for the playgroup tailored to Adam's age, interest, development, and skills being assessed. Before starting the group, the group leader educated the peers about Adam's AAC and modeled how he would communicate with them during the playgroup. She used a school iPad and played a game with the peers, demonstrating how the Proloquo 2 Go app is a way to hear someone's words and told them that Adam would use it to talk with them. She answered questions that the peers had about the iPad. Their new awareness and understanding created a positive space to allow the group process to begin. The leader selected play themes to the group meeting that focus on Adam's goals, initiating play, asking for help, and turn-taking. Adam sat down to play a turn-taking game with a peer. The group leader sat down with them and praised Adam for his interest. Adam, I like the way that you sat down with Veronica to play Fruit Stand Avalanche. Adam does not look up. Veronica hands Adam the orange tongs, asking him, Do you want to play with me? 
Adam's teacher knew he would not know how to play the game, which created the opportunity to practice asking for help. The group leader prompted Adam to use his iPad to say, I need help. Adams turns his iPad towards him, ordering the communication symbols and using his iPad to communicate and say, how do you play? The group leader looks to Veronica, who briefly explains how the game is played. The game lends itself to quick turn-taking between players. To promote turn-taking language during gameplay, the group reader removes one set of tongs from the game to encourage more turn-taking language between Adam and Veronica. Before Veronica takes her turn, she says, my turn, and puts her hand out as a prompt for Adam to hand her the tong. After taking her turn, she she waits for Adam to announce his turn, requesting the tongs. The group leader verbally prompts Adam to declare his turn by saying, my turn, pointing to him. Adam then responds to Veronica using his iPad saying, my turn. The group leader reinforces Adam when he uses the target social skills collaborates with his parents and other professionals to support the generalization of skills and provides support and shows gratitude to the peer models. Let's move on to our final strategy. We're going to conclude our discussion of evidence-based practices by discussing our last practice, peer-mediated interventions and other supports. Peer-mediated instruction and interventions are a group of evidence-based strategies that address social concerns by training peers without disabilities in ways to engage learners with autism in positive and meaningful social interactions. There is evidence to support the use of this practice with preschool to high school age students with autism to target a range of social communication and pre-academic academic skills. Several terms have been used to describe slightly different forms of peer mediated intervention. They include peer modeling, peer initiation training, direct training for target students and peer, peer networks, or peer supports. Let's look at some of these specifically. For many years, researchers have investigated the role that peers without disabilities can play in the social learning of children with autism. Peer-mediated intervention models, social skills in a naturalistic setting, and adults move into secondary roles. Many evidence-based social skills instruction paradigms involve training peers to work as buddies or tutors with their autistic peers. Some approaches include training a group of students, the entire class, or assigning an individual student to work with an autistic classmate. In general, children ages three to eight may benefit the most from peer-mediated training, which encourages peers to organize play, share, help, and praise their autistic peers. These behaviors promote communication, language, and basic social skills development. Older students ages 9 to 18 may be more interested in social networking strategies that can be implemented between classes, at lunch, or in other non-classroom settings. Overall, peer-mediated instruction and intervention follow the same principle. More social opportunities for learning can be created by teaching peers ways to interact with their classmates with autism. Depending on the needs or specific students or the resources available in a classroom, there are a variety of strategies that can be implemented. While peer-mediated interventions are beneficial for students with autism, benefits for the general education student body are also significant. This type of instruction promotes teamwork, encourages friendship, and celebrates diversity. A study focused on the experiences of peers found that a peer continued to express interest in supporting students in the future. Another study participant who served as a peer model shared, I'm not a bad person, but before this project, I wouldn't have been able to carry on a conversation with someone like my focus student. I think I had some misconceptions. By communicating with them, I have another view. When preparing a plan for peer-mediated instruction, a few planning steps will help things run more smoothly. First, be sure to identify times the social interaction naturally occurs. This is important for the peer and the student with autism. Next, it's time to identify and recruit peers. Contemplate the number of peers you might need and what students would make a good peer. Consider the peer's social skills, ability to follow adult directions, attendance records, a similar schedule to the identified autistic student, and a willingness to participate. The following steps involve training and the identified peer. It's essential to provide them with information about the student, the targeted skills, 
and the planning specified instructional strategies. Peers should be provided the opportunity to ask questions, get feedback, and role play. Depending on the age of the peer, remember to provide reinforcement by using labeled praise or high fives for acknowledging their participation and support. Now that you have trained your peers, it's in time to implement the plan. Encourage and coach the peer models to work with the identified student for at least 15 minutes a day and continue for at least three to four months. As a teacher, your degree of involvement and support will vary. Be prepared to coach and support the peer more intensely in the beginning and when you change the targeted social skill. Continue to meet with the trained peers. Keep training sessions short and convenient. Consider meeting with them over a pizza lunch. It's helpful to mark your calendars and meet with them every month. Meetings allow them to discuss any issues that may come up. After the peers are comfortable in their roles, begin encouraging participating peers to extend what they have learned into other parts of their day, for example, in the hallways, at lunch, or during after-school activities. Here's a quote from the research um, that focused on the perspective of students with autism on their participation in peer-mediated intervention. In an interview, 10-year-old Marlon shared that he really liked the student he was asked to work with and that he was pleased that he no longer had to always work alone during group tasks. Let's check in with Chris one last time. After a social skills group meeting, Miss Long meets with Chris to talk about a student named Sam, who is in another section of Chris's math class and is an active member of the robotics club. She explained that Sam is interested in ta- talking to Chris to help him make form- feel more welcomed and supported during robotics club meetings. She further explains that Sam wants to meet up with Chris and introduce himself before Chris attends his first club meeting. Chris agrees and Miss Long arranges for the three of them to meet during lunch. This peer-mediated intervention will be helpful in equipping Chris with the peer support and confidence to be successful at Robotics Club. Additionally, this strategy can have a positive impact on Sam in terms of appreciation of diversity and personal growth. It is important that Miss Long is specific when she meets with Sam to help tailor his support to meet Chris's needs and goals. Miss Long met with Sam before the lunch meeting and talked with him about Chris's goals and how Sam may be able to support Chris during the club meetings and activities. We talked about a lot of different strategies related to social skills instruction today. It can be overwhelming, so we would like to point out some additional resources you can access on your own. A few online resources that you might like to keep handy include... Um, some resources specific to Delaware would be the DNEA, which offers ongoing training technical assistance and online resources for professionals who support individuals with autism. The Center for Disability Studies works to enhance the lives of individuals with disabilities and their families through education, advocacy, service, and research. Autism Delaware offers family navigation and support, adult vocational services, workshops, recreational and social skills activities, and parent groups. Some other um, helpful resources include the Affirm models, which provide additional learning opportunities to dig deeper into content and evidence-based practices for individuals with autism. OCALI, which is the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence Disabilities. They offer professional development resources addressing autism and other complex disabilities. They gain knowledge through face-to-face training, training on demand, professional learning, communities, and online modules. The May Institute is a nonprofit organization that provides educational, rehabilitative, behavioral health care services to children and adults with autism. All resources discussed in today's training can be accessed by contacting the DNEA.